Welcome to Continuing Mobile Education for Emergency Medical Services Providers. This is Pediatric Assessment, Episode 1, Assessing the Infant. After viewing this episode, participants will review the physical and developmental characteristics of an infant. Participants will also review the barriers that influence the assessment of an infant and how to reduce them. Finally, participants will review normal and abnormal physical findings, vital signs, and weights of an infant. It's important to remember that uh, infants and children are not just small adults. When it comes to infancy, it's important to remember that there's actually two different time periods. We worry about the newborn phase, which is zero days to about 30 days or one month, and then the rest of infancy is one month to a year. And the reason that's important is the newborn um, has even more differences uh, from an adult than a regular infant would have. The anatomy there is just really hasn't been tested, so you're not sure if you're dealing with a child who has a congenital defect that has not presented itself yet. Specifically, we worry about a baby's head size compared to their body. It's very, very large, and it's very easy for them to obstruct their airway because their head will roll forward uh, if they're positioned incorrectly. A baby's tongue is also very large compared to their mouth, and so that too can obstruct their airway. And lastly, their airway itself is very anterior in the throat. It's important to remember that when you're dealing with a newborn infant, or actually a child under four months of age, there's very little that they could do themselves to cause injury. So should you be called for some type of injury, uh, a parent reports that a one-month-old perhaps rolled off a bed, you have to be suspicious that perhaps something else has happened to this child. Um, when you're under three to four months of age, uh, the baby's pretty stationary. They do not tend to roll over. Uh, they have limited use of their hands, but they're starting to be aware that they have control of their hands and you'll see them bring their hands to midline, uh, perhaps start to put their hands in their mouth. They should be able to make eye contact with you and, and have a nice social smile. Um, as you get older, more like a six month old, that child should be able to sit up, uh, certainly roll over, they'll babble and they'll interact with you and you can hand them things and uh, they'll take things from you. And so that's usually a pretty happy interactive child. So if you encounter a six month old who really seems to be very fussy uh, or not wanting to interact, that could be a clue that there's an underlying problem. As you progress closer to nine months of age, that child is gonna to start to crawl or, or scoot around and they usually can get themselves into trouble because parents often forget that a child who can pull to, sta to a standing position can then reach much higher than they used to be able to reach. So that child now might be able to get into a cupboard that perhaps has dangerous materials that they wouldn't be able to get to uh, just a month or so prior. Most kids around one year of age are starting to walk and once they can walk, they can get just about anywhere as well. Infants are separated into two phases, newborns from zero days to one month and infancy from one month to one year. Infants have a relatively large head and tongue, combined with an anterior airway places them at increased risk for an airway obstruction. Infants should have a social facial expression and have some level of interaction. Infants have not been fully screened for congenital or developmental disorders. When you're assessing an infant, it's often very helpful to uh, incorporate the parents in the evaluation. They, of course, are gonna know their child best and they'll be able to explain what is normal or abnormal for that child. Um, plus, involving the parent will often make the child, even a young infant, feel more comfortable and you'll usually get a better response. I think when you're dealing with someone under six months, um, you can approach them uh, right away. They certainly would not be scared of you, um, but just take things very, very slow, understanding that they have a very strong startle response and anything you do to startle them could cause them to cry, which could change your exam because that, of course, would increase their heart rate, um, might make them breathe more quickly, and that might skew the results you're getting on your exam. A child older than six months is usually very social and happy, and so if you approach them with a smile, uh, maybe have a toy, or just reach out to them very slowly, they'll usually want to interact with you. Um, even at this young age, sometimes it's best to start examining the parent first and then show the child that it, it doesn't hurt and things are gonna be fine, and then go ahead and examine the child. But there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to get through a complete exam, even on an infant. You just have to change things a little bit. For example, um, you'll know that the child is intact neurologically if they're able to reach for a toy using both of their hands. You're certainly not going to be able to say, put your right hand out in front of you, put your left hand out in front of you like you would with an adult. You just have to kind of do a lot of play uh, in your evaluation of the child instead of asking them to do specific tasks and expecting them to respond. Common barriers are because as EMS providers we look for a lot of verbal responses to our treatments or we look for some sort of acknowledgement to our treatments with infants, obviously you will not get that because they're not verbal. 
as well as mothers being or overprotective caretakers can be a, an obstacle that you'll have to overcome in order to be able to better assess or even complete an assessment on an infant. I think the hardest about infant assessments is when they're that very young newborn to one, um, one to three month years of age. I remember specifically having a, a baby that was seizing and it was just so tough to tell whether you know, it was seizing or involuntary movements. I was very young in my career and I hadn't been around a lot of infants at the time. And so it just made it really challenging to, to decide. And remembering to check a glucose, sometimes we don't want to stick babies, but we have to remember that we have to check glucoses on them just as much as any other age group. Important caveats is reassuring the infant. Depending on the age, if the infant is two months, it's easier than maybe a six-month-old who is learning to cling to their their parents, or you know maybe an eight-month-old. So the little one's okay because you can hold them, and you can feel them. When when you're holding them, you can feel their temperature. You're looking directly at the child. You can look at the color. You can see how the child is breathing. Um, when they're a little bit older, the, the parents may have the child, so and they may be crying more, and infants do cry a lot. You have to include the caretakers. A lot of times moms know their child better than any assessment can prove. So you really have to take into consideration, or EMS providers have to take into consideration, what are the caretakers saying that is different about this child and why you are there. Parents can identify acute changes in behavior and activity. Modify your standard assessment to incorporate play for means of evaluation. Definitely with infant assessments, respiratory rate in depth, um, how they're breathing, skin color, it tells a lot and heart rate tells a lot. Those are really your identifiers with assessment with infant. Normal vital signs for infants and especially their weight um, can vary quite a bit. Uh, and they're often thought to be pretty scary set of vital signs because it can be very normal for a young child to have a heart rate of 180, 190, and that be totally fine. Um, when you're dealing with an infant or a young child, it's really important that you look at the whole picture. A heart rate of 180 in a 65-year-old could certainly be very concerning, but a heart rate of 180 in a happy, playful infant is, is perfectly appropriate. Um, we often see them breathe up into rates of 30 or 40 as well. And I usually like to say, as long as you have a, a peaceful, quiet, uh, increased respiratory rate, that that's fine. If you have a child who seems to be struggling to breathe and breathing quickly, then regardless of the rate, then that certainly is a concern. But if you have a happy, playful child who's breathing, breathing at 35 times a minute, that's probably going to be just fine. Uh, most newborns uh, weigh around three kilograms, so somewhere between six and eight pounds. Uh, and then they'll double their weight usually by six months of age. And then the average uh, one-year-old is somewhere around 10 kilograms. So I usually like to keep that in my head, the 10 kilos by one year, and then just kind of work your way down depending on where you are um, in that first year of life. Heart rates can vary quite a bit, as I mentioned, and it's, it's not unusual to, for a young child to have a bit of an irregular heart rate as well. Um, you wanna look at the heart rate in conjunction with how they're perfusing. So if you have nice warm extremities, um, with a, even a, a relatively low heart rate or a relatively high heart rate, things are probably going to be fine. But an infant most likely is not going to be able to perfuse well if they have a heart rate under 60. That certainly would be very, very concerning. Um, a respiratory rate under uh, 15, roughly, uh, could certainly be concerning. Again, you have to look at the whole picture, though. Babies are notorious for doing what's called periodic breathing, where they might breathe very, very quickly for 20 to 30 seconds, have a bit of a pause, uh, and then breathe slowly for another 20 or 30 seconds and then balance out. Um, the true definition of apnea would be no respiratory effort for 20 seconds or greater. EMS providers really need to remember that you have to do a complete assessment just like you have to do on any other patient. With again hitting that heart rate, uh, skin color, and respiratory rate really being your, your identifiers. We're remaining calm. We are not going to break them. Um, a lot of times EMS providers, because they're so little, we become uncomfortable with this age group, but they're not breakable, they're not gonna, they're not gonna break, we'll be more than, you're more than able to keep, take care of them. And really using, assessing the scene, making sure if you have parents that are out of control that are gonna inhibit your assessment, then you need to remove them. If you're gonna have parents that you can calm down and be inclusive in your assessment, then use them. That's the biggest um, parts of advice that I can give you for assessing an infant. Normal vitals for an infant includes a heart rate of 100 to 160 beats per minute, a respiratory rate of 30 to 60 breaths per minute, a weight of 10 kilograms by one year. Blood pressure will vary, but is normally lower than a child. 
Evaluation of perfusion and clinical presentation of the patient is the foundation of assessment. Abnormal vital signs with an asymptomatic presentation can be normal. After viewing this episode, participants will review the physical and developmental characteristics of an infant. Participants will also review the barriers that influence the assessment of an infant and how to reduce them. Finally, participants will review normal and abnormal physical findings, vital signs, and weights of an infant.